with Davos here and the U.S. stock market's still soaring, the S&P 500 is at 3,329.62. The Dow is well over 29,000 and Barron's just issued, and this is the Barron's curse, just issued a Dow 30,000 magazine cover. So that's a contrarian indicator out there. We'll see, though, with what the central banks are doing with money and credit growth. The NASDAQ well over 9,000 at 9,388. And the dollar index, shockingly, is at 97.61, well above the bear market that the dollar bears and dollar collapse people and January 14th people are claiming. In spite of the U.S. stock market, what we have in the last six weeks is unprecedented, the amount of warnings that are coming out. Unprecedented for credit unprecedented for credit growth, and unprecedented for total amount of debt. So today we had another warning come out from the new IMF cheat. Uh, IMF cheat, wow, that was a Freudian slip. IMF chief chairwoman Kristalina Georgieva. <laughs> IMF cheat, that was hilarious. That was totally unintentional. Um, that was just funny. So we, we have the warning from the IMF. We have multiple reports out from the World Bank recently. We have the Bank of International Settlement report that came out in early December warning about credit and debt and also, you know, repo madness, forward dollar swaps. And then the International Institute of Finance. Let me shut off my phone now. Don't want any more distractions. The International Institute of Finance also just issued a report in the last week talking about how global debt to GDP ratio now hit an all time high of 322%. Wow, just um, amazing. This is what this is the end stages of a digital debt based fiat currency and credit Ponzi scheme global, where since 2008. To, according to my estimates, it might be over a hundred trillion dollars, at least, or over a hundred trillion in fiat currency and credit that has been created to put out derivative fires or currency swaps or, you know, just a, just ridiculous bailout programs and emergency liquidity loans. I just saw a new tweet out from Yuan Talks, which covers China at Yuan Talks. So follow them on Twitter, talking about how China just did another emergency reverse repo program after another one a few days ago of $200 billion. They just did another one. It's getting absolutely ridiculous at this stage. Meanwhile, the U.S. stock market, the asset markets, are getting more and more divorced from reality on a daily basis. So let me get into the IMF article. How's this for some New Year's optimism? The new head of the IMF, who took over from Christine Lagarde in November, warned that the global economy could soon find itself mired in a Great Depression. During a speech at the Peterson Institute, IMF chairwoman Kristalina Georgieva compared the contemporary global economy to the, quote, roaring 20s of the 20th century. Remember, I've been comparing a lot of the mistakes that are being made in the last 10 years to the 1920s and 30s, and it's only accelerating with Trump adding all these tariffs and tit-for-tat tariffs and trade wars and currency wars, etc. A decade of cultural and financial excess that culminated in the great market crash of 1929, and the Fed also made enormous amounts, the Federal Reserve also made enormous amounts of mistakes prior to the 1929 crash. According to The Guardian, this research suggests that a similar trend is already underway, and though the collapse might not be around the corner, when it comes, it will be impossible to avoid. This is in spite of the stock market soaring, so the, the actual problems in the real economy get worse. Meanwhile, all this fiat currency and credit is going somewhere, and apparently its preferential choice is into the U.S. stock market. That's one of the main preferential choices, is buying up the Dow, buying up the NASDAQ, buying up the S&P 500. While the inequality gap between countries has closed over the last two decades, the gap within most developed countries has widened, leaving millions more vulnerable to a global downturn than they otherwise would have been. In particular, she singled out the United Kingdom for criticism. In the UK, for example, the top 10% now control nearly as much wealth as the bottom 50%. Again, this wealth gap is what caused a lot of the monetary a lot of the populism problems in the night social problems in the 1920s and 30s and why socialism became so popular so again a lot of problems that are repeating or history doesn't exactly repeat but it does rhyme 
If you want to read a book about this, Neil Howe's The Fourth Turning, it's available on audiobook. And there's all, Neil Howe, I think, works for Hedgeye now. So there's a bunch of Neil Howe interviews. He did one for Macro Voices not too long ago, and then he get, does interviews on Hedgeye every uh, three or four months. Also, Real Vision TV, he did a long one on Real Vision TV over the summer. Grant Williams came down here to the DC metro area. And uh, he interviewed Neil Howe on, on video, on TV. Well, for their TV, but it's really just video. It's not live TV. In particular, she's saying, okay, UK also warned about potential for, okay, skip that part. IMF isn't the first institution to try and gird the global financials. Okay, let me just skip to the World Bank stuff because that's really more interesting. World Bank, this was at the end of December 29th, 2019, World Bank issued another report last week when it joined the Bank of International Settlements. The central bank, central bank, is perhaps more notable for the fact that not a single central bank actually listens to its recommendations. Neither do a lot of the regular banks, um, a lot of the regular large banks, in warning that the largest and fastest rise in global debt in half a century could lead to another financial crisis as the world economy slows. In a report titled, quote, Global Waves of Debt, the World Bank looked at the four major episodes of debt increases that have occurred in more than 100 countries since 1970, the Latin American debt crisis of the 1980s, the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, and the global financial crisis from 2007 to 2009. While not finding anything the I IF did, the International Institute of Finance, didn't already point out in the month before in another report, the bank set and the International Institute of Finance issued an, issued another warning this past week about total global debt to GDP now at an all-time high, 322%. The bank said during the fourth wave from 2010 to 2018, the debt to GDP ratio of developing countries has risen by more than half to 168%. That was a faster increase on an annual basis than during the Latin American debt crisis. Wow. And the Latin American debt crisis was crazy with defaults and problems. I believe the Federal Reserve Bank had to step in with currency swaps back then. They were smaller, but still more bailouts. And as if the International Institute of Finance found previously, the rise in debt has been uh, across both private companies and governments across the world, amplifying the risk if there is another global financial crisis. As a reminder, this is what global debt looked like 20 years ago. Say that they have some charts and graphs. If you want to look in this, there was the other, let me see if I can pull up, if I have both. Okay, this is the World Bank report from January 9th in a CNBC article by Sam Meredith, World Bank warns of global debt crisis following the fastest increase in borrowing since the 1970s. In its biannual Global Economic Prospectus report, GEP report, published in the first week of January, the Washington, D.C.-based group said that there have been four waves of debt accumulation over the last 50 years. The current wave, which started in 2010, is thought to be this is very interesting here. The, quote, largest, fastest, and most broad-based increase in global borrowing since the 1970s. And China's credit bubble, which I don't know if it says it in the report, but China's credit bubble from other research I've read is the largest and fastest growing credit bubble in the last 10 years in world history. No other country has added over $40 trillion worth of credit in only 10 years. Quote, the history and China's throwing in is projected in 2020 to throw another $4 trillion in credit at their economy, and their economy already has debt problems and credit problems and paying back credit. The history of past waves, because that's an, a policy order from Beijing, so that's not the free market voting that there should be more credit issued. That's Beijing and the People's Bank of China saying we need to not slow down on the credit, even though the credit cannot be paid, we have to throw more credit at it. Quote, the history of past waves of debt accumulation shows that these waves tend to have unhappy endings. A. Han Koz, director of the World Bank's Prospectus Group, said in the report, the World Bank has warned of the risk of a fresh global debt crisis, urging governments and central banks to recognize that historically low interest rates may not be enough to offset another widespread financial meltdown. Also, and the Federal Reserve has been talking about this, worrying about this publicly now for the last month or so, that they're worried that all these low interest rates are starting to cause bubbles, something that people like Bill Fleckenstein and many others have been criticizing the Alan Greenspan Fed, the Bernanke Fed, the Janet Yellen Fed about for a very, very long time, over a decade. The World Bank has warned, okay, widespread financial meltdown. The current wave started in 2010, is thought to be the fastest, largest, and most broad-based increase. World Bank said that while low levels of interest rates, which financial markets expect 
to be sustained over the medium term, quote, mitigate some of the risks associated with high debt levels. The previous three waves of broad-based debt accumulation all ended with financial crises in many developing and emerging economies. Quote, global quote, low global interest rates provide only a precarious protection against financial crises. Actually, they provide an illusion of the economy is doing well, higher asset prices mean that people think the economy is doing well, or some people think, or some people are fooled. And they also create a moral hazard and more risk-taking and more leverage. And this system does not need any more derivatives and any more leverage. And guess what? In the last 10 years, there's been an explosion in certain different types of derivatives, especially forward dollar swaps in the last three years, but also now leveraged loans. Leveraged loans are growing according to the Fed's. The, the other warnings are from the central banks themselves. So not only from the IMF, the World Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, the International Institute of Finance, we also have warnings from the Bank of Japan, warnings from the European Central Bank that I've covered, and also warnings from the Federal Reserve in their November 2019 financial stability report which was documenting the ridiculous amounts of growth in things like leverage loans and student loan debt. Leverage loans, according to the Fed's own research, leverage loans are growing at 14% per year now. And that's an insane mark. The leverage loan market is now over $1 trillion in size and still growing very quickly. It should not be growing at all, but it still is. And those leverage loans are then chopped up into pieces like, like sausage, like how sausage is made, and then stuffed to different degrees, like toxic sausage into collateralized loan obligations or CLOs because central banks and governments manipulated interest rates lower, or artificially suppress them, and people still need income, pension funds and retirees still need income savers. And so people are desperate. People are overpaying for overvalued dividend stocks just for a dividend yield. People are willing to buy junk bonds and those yields are not pricing in the risk properly. And then, of course, people in exchange for income are gambling that these CLOs, the different tranches of different rated CLOs, just like mortgage-backed securities prior to 2008, that these will not blow up. Ticking time bomb. Fourth wave of debt, global debt found to, be, to bear many similarities to the previous three, changing global financial landscape, mounting vulnerabilities, and concerns about inefficient use of borrowed funds. The first three waves of global debt accumulation were identified as running from 1970 to 1989, 1990 to 2001, and 2002 to 2009. It listed a menu of four policy options for countries to reduce the likelihood of the current global debt wave ending in crises, and if crises were to take place to alleviate their impact. I don't think they're going to be able to deal with things exactly how they have in the past. Maybe currency swaps. That's what Roberto Perley, the former Federal Reserve economist, has been has been recommending for a month now. I want to talk about Richard Duncan. So Richard Duncan is a former economist, I think. It was either the IMF or the World Bank, one of those. Very, very smart guy. I've interviewed him, Mo and I, when he was still on this, uh, working at my company over the years in the past. It's in the archives on the channel. And he's a very smart guy. He, he actually diagnoses the problem correctly, I would say. He talks about this system that we have now, all these governments, all these central banks. So we're on a dollar standard now because the dollar is not backed by gold. So we're on a dollar standard now. But all these governments and central banks, it's, it's what Richard Duncan calls quote unquote creditism. So basically what that means, in my opinion, is credit has to grow. Chris Martinson has a really interesting chart about the 2008 financial crisis and how a tiny little blip in credit where Keynesians like Paul Krugman and other scumbags were screaming about the horrors of deflation with a tiny little drop in credit. And if credit and money supply don't routinely grow, then the system can collapse. And that's because of the amount of derivatives already outstanding and the leverage. So asset prices then falling with the amount of leverage already in the system and the derivatives markets and how those bets are, all it takes is one bank that's over leveraged or a couple large hedge funds that are over leveraged and it starts to, to take a domino or chain reaction. So Richard Duncan calls this creditism where credit is basically credit growth has to keep growing in perpetuity and credit has is basically the same as currency creation at this point because it is debt-based money, but also because the money supply and credit have to grow nonstop. 
But unfortunately, Richard Duncan says his solution, and I'm using air quotes, is that they need to print the central bankers and governments to save World War III, to prevent World War III, a kinetic war. They need to print trillions and trillions, hundreds of trillions, over 100 trillion, I've heard Richard Duncan talk about in the past, for estimates to spend that money more wisely. So they just need to go crazy. That would be like if Donald Trump, and I don't, I don't expect him to announce this publicly, where if Donald Trump said that the U.S. is going to spend an additional like $21 trillion or more in the near future on the Space Force. Although I think that will eventually happen. I think that this, they're not going to publicly announce that they're going to spend $21 trillion on the Space Force, but I think it's a lot. The Space Force is the new quote-unquote black hole where all this money siphoned off maybe hundreds of billions or 500, 500 billion or half three quarters of a trillion or a trillion are going to be siphoned off into the Space Force. The Space Force is the new black budget, the new black hole for spending. Santana says there is no money. Yes, it's a digital debt-based fiat currency. So if you want to read more about these reports and the warnings, this is unprecedented because I do not remember this amount of warnings in 2007 leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. So there was IndyMac, there were some, some hedge funds for Bear Stearns and others that were having problems, and it was all dismissed. It was all that... These are small hedge funds. These are isolated incidents. Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan, he was still there at the Fed, were on TV. Bernanke was saying subprime is contained, housing prices never go down, blah, blah, blah. But here we are with an unprecedented amount of warnings in the last six weeks. And in my opinion, this is happening because if you note, know, well, from the central banks, it's it's there's a lot of truth hidden in the financial stability reports that come out. For the Fed, every two years, I'm not sure about the how quick each the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank each release, but for the Fed, it's twice a year. It's in March and November. And there is grains of truth hidden in the data and the analysis in those reports. But I think all these people are trying to go on the record saying, well, we warned you. We gave you a warning in advance. We don't know exactly when things are going to crash, but we did give you guys a fair warning. We went on the record a couple weeks, a couple months, maybe six months or something, maybe a year before everything crashed again and we gave you a warning. So I think that's why these reports are coming out very quickly because I think people want to go on the record and say, okay, we warned you. So I think that's why within the last six weeks we're getting this many warnings out. I cannot remember this many warnings in a short amount of time. We got three super chats from Durf. Thank you, Durf. From Justin. Thank you, Justin. Wally. Thank you, Wally. He asks, how have they been able to keep the derivatives market going considering it's been over a quadrillion dollars? And that's what's been admitted. Well, for, first of all, the quadrillion, it's down. So the Bank of International Settlements is now saying it's like, I think it's like 500, 400 trillion. They've, they've said it's come down. And they claim everything's netted out. But I think in actuality, anytime there's problems with a firm like Deutsche Bank, I think there's been currency swaps printed. And they, the, their excuse is, number one, the Fed's not independently audited. So the Fed doesn't have to reveal its real currency swap positions. Only if the Fed wants to publicly disclose that do they have to actually say their amount of currency swap positions. But the Fed can just say, very similarly to Repo Madness, how it's only temporary. So my educated guess is without actually seeing the audit, independent audits of these central banks is that there has been problems in the derivatives markets and the central banks like the European Central Bank or the Fed or together with the European Central Bank and the Fed, maybe they both have had to step in for Deutsche Bank or a counterparty to Deutsche Bank or now it seems HSBC might be having some problems or Citibank, one of the two. It seems that there's some serious... Uh, Christopher Whalen has been covering this, so he's written two 
two uh, good blog articles in the last few months. You can search on his website, The Institutional Risk Analyst. I put those links in, in the, um, under podcast in the last like couple months. There was the new one about HSBC came out last week. So I think they get away with it because there is no audits, real independent transparent audits. There is no full audits, just like there is no audits of the U.S. gold. So there's no audits of the Fed to look at what they're doing to help in the derivatives market. There is no, it, and it's very similar to what the Fed is doing now with Repo Madness, that they're saying that all this stuff is temporary. It's only short term. But we're at a stage now with the repo market where the Fed is not buying any more mortgage-backed securities officially on their balance sheet, on their website, where they're dumping mortgage-backed securities like crazy because there is no demand globally for a lot of treasuries. Now, there is demand for dollars but to help pay back for dollar-denominated debt, but there's very little demand globally for treasuries. There's um, a lot of countries are actually net sellers of treasuries, so the Fed has to, with more of its balance sheet, the Fed has to buy more treasuries. And that's part of the repo problems there because the primary dealers and the large banks cannot, unless you believe everything Victor Sperandio is saying about hold to maturity counts, the large money center banks, the four large banks in the U.S. and the primary dealers, there's uh, 24 primary dealers, but a lot of them are not anywhere near as big as the investment bank, as, as the four largest U.S. banks. But they're on the hook to contractually buy a bunch of treasuries that they can't afford to buy. So my educated guess then with how the Fed puts out derivative fires is they've been doing a lot of these currency swap lines with the European Central Bank. Either the Fed is doing it themselves or the both central banks are coordinating things and they're saying it's only temporary and most people don't find out about it. Most people aren't aware of this with the Fed, but the Fed actually, Danielle DiMartino Booth disclosed this, but the Fed actually to get a, a job at the Fed as a PhD economist and move up promotions at the fed you have to you have to have security clearances so you cannot talk about a lot of the things like that with the currency swaps and the other stuff you could lose your job it's a national security issue danielle demartina booth disclosed this a couple months ago she said that her security clearance at the fed wasn't high enough to be privy to all the different discussions um, LPJ says HSBC is a China bank. Um, not technically. It's technically a European and British bank, but they do most of their business in Hong Kong and, main, and mainland China. So uh, HSBC's most profitable division is in Hong Kong and mainland China, but they most of their executives are not Chinese. And if you believe the rumors, what Kyle Bass has been saying, the Bank of England is very upset with the stuff that's been going on at HSBC Bank. And now you have five or six senior HSBC Bank executives who have left since May, I think, May 2019. Got a $5 super chat from Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, I'll take a look at listener questions and comments. Finance Freak says he's sure the Fed who got us here can fix the problem. If the problem is they can fix the problem by papering over everything, just sweeping the poop under the rug and putting newspapers on top of it and saying that there is no poop that or that it was cleaned up. Meanwhile, the reality is that um, there's more stagflate and tax and lie on Main Street and everyone's bills are going to go up. Food, health care, rent, all those bills are going up. And the inflation statistics are not covering that. A gold-backed XRP cryptocurrency problem solved? No, that's not a good solution. Wayne says that the 50 percent okay now it's 40 percent he updated his calculations 40 percent of the quote unquote good collateral for repo madness is now mortgage-backed securities not treasuries 
So mortgage-backed securities are now taking up the majority of collateral, I think, for repo madness. Well, actually, treasuries are still the most, but not by much anymore. Surprisingly, we haven't gotten leveraged loans and CLOs yet, but I think it's only a matter of time. Those have not blown up yet, so the payments are still being made on leveraged loans and CLOs, at least some of them. Um, in the IBGI says in the 1920s, people borrowed to buy stocks a margin. In 2020, businesses borrowed to buy back stock, totally different. Um, nowadays, people are uh, the record amounts of margin debt are actually sky high. So people are buying stocks on margin. You have the shared buybacks too. And then you have the explosion again in jumbo mortgages, home equity loans of credit are starting again here in the US. Home equity loans in Canada are nuts. Australia has an enormous housing bubble that the government doesn't want to talk about. I think there's a lot of similarities to 1920. In 1920, there was a big property prior to the 1929 crash. In the 1920s, there was a big property bubble in Florida. So there was big speculative real estate on debt. So people bought stocks on margin. There was a property bubble in Florida. You had flight capital, tons of flight capital coming into the U.S. from 1927 to 1929. Because every other country, the global economy was already in a recession or depression. And the U.S. was the last economy that went into depression prior to October 1929. And the price action in the major stock market indexes, IBJI, is very similar to the crack-up boom in 1927. To what happened to the major U.S. stock market indexes in 1927 to 29. Might be having a blow-off top now. I mean, the way things are going, guys, we might have Dow 30,000 in a week or two. That's how crazy things are going. A couple more good tweets from Trump, a couple more good press releases, might have Dow 30,000 in a couple weeks. What will happen, Apple Fritter asks, what will happen to the Canadian dollar when the U.S. dollar collapses? I think people are going to begin to question all currencies. I think all currencies are going to have problems. All these currencies are a disaster. Peter Schiff is saying his organizational philosophy at his firm is that all these other foreign currencies and all these other foreign economies are better and that when the dollar goes down and when the U.S. economy collapses, these other economies will decouple from the U.S. economy and the dollar, and I do not believe that to be true. I think if the dollar crashes and I think if the U.S. economy collapses, I think all those other currencies are going are getting dragged down with it. But there's a lot of people that believe that the economy would be a lot better off without the dollar and with the U.S. economy. But a lot of these other foreign economies and emerging markets, they've leverage their economies to export to China or to export to the U.S. I would say over-leveraged their economies to export to China, over-leveraged their economies on base metals and energy to mine and produce those, and then over-leveraged their economies to export to the U.S. Yes, Peter Schiff has been preaching decoupling. I'm not sure if he's still talking about China decoupling from the U.S. China and the U.S. cannot play well together. They really, they have a very unhealthy relationship, very toxic relationship. They should not be, they should not be doing trading. The U.S.-China economic relationship is very frayed. If you can't play, we learned this in kindergarten. If you can't play well nicely together, you shouldn't play at all. Anthony says, gold money agreed to pay you out. Yeah, I have to do that too. I have to do that too. I was dealing with a couple gold money fanboys on Twitter who are annoying me. 
apparently you're not allowed to criticize gold money at all, their business at all. I get emails from a lot of people who are gold money customers who have had problems. Smaller, they have not done a good job with their smaller customers. Yeah, so the let me talk a little bit more about the solution in air quotes to what Richard Duncan is saying. His solution is that the central planners, these PhD economists, these politicians, technocrats, bureaucrats, Keynesians, that they have not spent the money correctly and that we need to print many, many trillions more and spend the money instead on developing new industries like nanotechnology and space and infrastructure and a bunch of other things but this is that would be very very inflationary to the real economy if that happened and there's no guarantees that that money spent would be any less wasteful than the money that's already been spent i mean china's already tried to do that with the central planning in the last decade and go and go and look at the documentaries of all the empty buildings now in china that are in disrepair dilapidated falling apart. A3 Skyware asks, why would repo stop? I see no evidence that repos will stop. In fact, Vice President of the Federal Reserve Chairman, um, excuse me, Vice President of the Federal Reserve Richard Clarita said that repos are going through tax day, which is what, April 16th, April 15th? So there's a good chance we're going to have a reef, reefer repo madness or repo repo madness. <laughs> repo reefer madness or reefer repo madness on 420, which then I will do a, if someone hasn't uh, drawn out a cool background for that, that's goofy, with unicorns and rainbows in there, with, uh, marijuana, with marijuana logos and unicorns and rainbows and Repo Madness in there. If someone hasn't done fan art for that, then I will make a marijuana background with Repo, Repo Madness on it. And I will do a podcast. And it will be an inside baseball joke. Jebediah Dean says big tech and even tech in general is now filled with idiots, especially at the top, because the companies can survive on the easy money. I wouldn't call those people idiots. I would say they're very book smart, but they're very idealistic. I've, I know I've met a lot of socialists and Marxists at those big technology companies. I was invited to a YouTube creators event in May of 2016 here at the Google location in Washington, D.C., and I did not get invited back after that probably because they're aware of my comments on social media about YouTube criticizing them. But there was a lot of Marxists and socialists who work for Google and YouTube, P people who are literally making six or seven figures, sometimes, sometimes even more than that, the executives at the top who are socialists or Marxists or champagne socialists. They make ins insane amounts of money, insane stock options, and their political preferences <laughs> are ridiculous. They do not align with their, their uh, bank accounts and their paychecks. Um, the U.S. deficit is projected to be, I've seen different estimates, either $1.2 trillion officially or $1.4 trillion. I've seen one estimate, I think, over $1.4 trillion for 2020. Forget where I saw that. But most of the estimates for budget deficits for the U.S. that I've seen officially are between $1.2 trillion and $1.4 Yeah, I mean, some of these, some of these Google or YouTube employees, they wear like very hardcore socialist or Marx shirts, like Che Guevara and other hardcore socialist and Marx shirts, and then they go in and make six or seven figures a year. It's the height of hypocrisy. Just like Hollywood celebrities, DC politicians, Republicans, and Democrats.
So in spite of all these crazy warnings, we are seeing the stock market, the U.S. stock market. Now, the, the other stock markets are not doing well. China stock market's not doing well. A lot of these other stock markets are not doing well. They're already in bear market territory, depression territory, these other stock markets. It's really just the U.S. stock market that's in this melt up or blow off top or crack up boom phase, whatever you want to call it. So things are accelerating. Probably time for for another couple tweets from Trump or another press release, and we might get Dow 30,000 by the end of the week or in the next week or two. That's how crazy things are getting. Well, what's funny, Anthony, is these hedge funds that were on the sidelines that were not long stocks because they've missed out on these gains these hedge funds that were not long stocks are now having to buy stocks to catch up and some of these hedge fund managers that were on the sidelines they're risking career risk by not buying the general stock market oh thank you sean his thoughts and prayers are with me in the state of virginia yeah the state of virginia is a mess our governor should have lost his job our lieutenant governor should have been fired Remember the yearbook photos with the blackface and the KKK photo from his, uh, what, law school? Was it college or law school? Or no, it was medical school. He's a doctor. And from what I've heard from a couple different sources, he was not the guy in blackface, but he managed to dodge that scandal. The mainstream media doesn't even want to talk about that. The local media doesn't even want to talk about that. I live right outside of D.C. in Northern Virginia. It's even more expensive living directly in D.C. There's a lot of extra taxes. Uh, Robert says, Dow 100,000, bread 200, or Robert, the portion of your bread is reduced by 50 or 60% in the next like six to 10 years. And they keep the bread around the same price, and the amount of bread you get is cut more than cut in half. Most likely, that is what's going to happen with shrinkflation and stagflation and stagflate and tax and lie. Uh, yeah, D DC has restaurant taxes and sales taxes, a lot of other taxes. It's a mess. Christopher says, Main Street is waking up to the lies, finally. Yes, a lot of people are waking up. They are figuring out that their standard of living is declining a lot and their cost of living is going up. So even though the government says there is no inflation, taxes are going up like crazy. Unfortunately, Christopher, a lot of people are siding with Bernie Sanders and the socialists, the Democratic socialists. And by the way, Democrat, Democratic socialists, that's what Frederick Engels was. So claiming that you're a democratic socialist and you're not a real socialist, you're just copying the, the lie, the trick that Frederick Engels used. It's a clever ploy. Most people aren't going to call him out on it. Yeah, so people are identifying the problem that their standard of living is declining rapidly, their cost of living is going up, taxes are going up, but... What they're viewing, they're identifying some of the problems or at least some of the problems. I don't know about all the problems, but they're at least identifying some of the problems. But their solutions are they want bigger government. They want more socialism. That's the pro That's the main problem. The solution should not be bigger government. It should not be giving the government more power. It should not be keeping these central banks in power. We need to educate people that the central banks are causing the majority of the problems. The problems are with fiat currencies themselves and credit. Oh, we got a Bernie Sanders supporter here. Oh, that's cute. There was a there was an idiot troll like a week ago. He copied and pasted how Bernie was the only person. He put it in the live chat. It was a paragraph long. How Bernie was the only person capable. He was the only honest person and the only per only honest politician and the only person capable of saving us from all the bad things in society, the environment, etc.
Blake asks, do I think the bankers are going to crash the economy to get Trump out or prop it up for the election? I think it's looking like the bankers are going to prop up the stock market for the election. You know what? The bankers are looking at alternatives and the bankers are seeing that Elizabeth Warren is actually worse than Trump. So Wall Street pulled their support for Elizabeth Warren. I think the insurance, there's a lot of large corporations that are now very, very, they've cooled off on Elizabeth Warren. So Elizabeth Warren, she's pissed off the health insurance companies. She's pissed off Wall Street. So all of her funding and support seems to be pulled pretty quickly. So Wall Street is looking like, well, we we don't want to support Elizabeth Warren now. And Bernie Sanders is it's too much. He's too socialist. So Wall Street may make a compromise and say, oh, we'll give Trump one more, some, one more, um, we'll quietly support Trump, or at least we won't sabotage him. Wayne says Elizabeth backstabbed Bernie. No one likes her anymore. She, she eventually backstabs everyone. She has a long-term track record of lying and making things up and taking advantage of the system and gaming it. Didn't Trump kiss up to J.P. Morgan recently? I think he kissed up to J.P. Morgan on the Phase 1 trade deal. I think he did. Oh, I would love to see Trump debate Bernie Sanders. That would be hilarious. I would love to see that. I mean, they, the name-calling would be hilarious. The zingers, the one-liners the name calling it wouldn't be a good political debate it would be like a good saturday night live skit or a good mad tv skit Yeah, so I think there's a lot of, with the derivatives, the size of the derivatives market and the subprime auto loans, the student loan debt, the leveraged loans, the forward dollar swaps, you know, all these, the CLOs, all these things that are going on. Anytime one of these things blows up, I think the central banks are stepping in. Nope, I did not see the Peter Zihan video you just sent me. I was watching the football games prior to the show. I'm trying to attempt to have a little bit of a life here besides just doing, con I mean, I love making the content. I need to occasionally take a break. Um, central banks are socialism. They were a main tenant of what the socialists wanted. Central banks, I'll repeat this again. Central banks are socialism. So if anyone tells you central banks are capitalism, no. Central banks are socialism. They are bailout mechanisms for the Wall Street banks, large corporations, and big government. Okay, well, I think this is enough for tonight. Just want to thank everyone for listening to this. Listen to me rant a little bit. But again, this is unprecedented, The last, in my opinion, the last six weeks with warnings out, reports out from the World Bank, reports out from the IMF, reports out from the Bank of International Settlements, and even the financial stability reports out in the last month or two from the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve, detailing a lot of the problems. So they're going on the record. If you know where to look, there's good pieces of information hidden in these reports and warnings. And meanwhile, the stock market is like, everything's fine. <laughs> meanwhile, the stock market, you know, like the Barron's cover, right? Dow 30,000. You guys have to see this Barron's cover. It's very, the Barron's has a history of being the top in a lot of things. Like when gold was at 1900 in 2011, didn't Barron's put like gold 5,000? They put gold on the cover. So Barron's has a history of a lot of these marking the top in a lot of markets with the technology bubble and other things. Global reset. 
Yeah, I don't know when they would do that, and I don't know what a reset exactly would look like because the problem is a lot of this debt is someone else's asset. But what we have with, so in, in university and master's economics programs and PhD economists and MBA programs, they teach, and Jim Chanos has said this, that savings equals investment, and that's what people are taught in schools at universities, and it's not true. In a fractional reserve banking system, savings does not equal investment. So global savings does not equal global investment. With a fractional reserve fiat current debt-based, digital debt-based fiat currency and credit system, savings does not equal investment because the assets are bought with massive amounts of leverage, not savings. And the banks, te technically the banks don't even need to have depositors anymore. I mean, that's just to keep their tax bills down for banks to have depositors in a digital debt-based fractional reserve banking system, the banks don't even need depositor cash anymore. The banks just get, when, when the banks screw up, if they're large enough, they just get more reserves from the Fed. And I've talked, I've interviewed Nomi Prinz about this. She was a director at Goldman Sachs and Bear Stearns. So say, anyone who tells you savings equals investment because they, they got, you know, A's in their MBA class or A's in their university business or economics course that savings equal investment is bullshit well i got a lot of super chats today one two three four five six seven seven or eight seven sparsh primo asks will the economy tank enough for trump to lose that's a good question the real economy is starting to sputter the jobs numbers, they made the jobs numbers look better, but the ISM numbers were bad. You know, as long as the stock market stays up, I think Trump's probably going to win, win re-election, at least for now. Now, maybe in six months, things will change. But as of now, I think Trump, uh, I know the betting markets, the political betting markets have Trump with a, a good percentage of winning. What I forget the website said so track the betting markets. For political elections. Okay, well, thank you everyone for the super chats. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much to my almost 250 now Patreon account contributors. I have around 250 now total in Patreon account contributors and PayPal monthly PayPal contributors. Again, thank you to my dozen or so monthly PayPal contributors and people throw me a tip once in a while. I do take the top six cryptocurrencies if people want to throw me a little tip for making content, working hard and making content like this. Even though Bill Holter won't like it, I do like some cryptocurrencies on the side there. I haven't sold any of the crypto. Well, I sold some Ethereum a long time ago, but I haven't sold any of the other cryptocurrencies I own. Okay, everyone, and the articles I discussed, the links will be in the information and description section after the video. Everyone have a nice week.